Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the great honor of introducing a fellow Kentuckian and a very distinguished one who has dedicated her life to higher education. She's in her fifth year of a very successful uh, term of service as president of Kentucky State University in Frankfurt, uh, coming to us after an eight-year tenure at the University of Texas at Dallas. She has more uh, initials after her name than in it, uh, with a Literally, with a bachelor's degree from Tougaloo College, a master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, both in, uh, all in sociology, and an MBA from Abilene Christian College in Dallas. Uh, to accompany all those degrees are an equally impressive list of honors, including the Woman of, Women of Excellence Award, Texas Women of Distinction Award, uh, the Outstanding Texan Award presented by the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. She was also awarded the Ford Foundation Doctor of Fellowship a doctoral fellowship for black Americans in the National Institute of Mental Health Fellowship and Societal Change and Human Development. Uh, but nothing on her resume can truly reflect the, the passion and the commitment and the character of someone whom I consider a friend and who has done an incredible job at Kentucky State. Dr. Mary Sias, welcome. I appreciate you affording me the opportunity to speak to you this morning. And my uh, remarks were really centered on two things, the continued viability of historically black colleges and universities and the expansion of Section 326E1, eligibility of historically black graduate institutions programs contained in H.R. 4137, Section 306. When I read the newspapers daily and I listen to the news, I see that we have challenges and we will continue to have those challenges confront us for a very long time in our complex world. Solutions are not going to come from simply the privileged few who've had the opportunity for a quality education, but rather from those whose ACT and SAT scores may be modest, but they have had a chance to receive a quality education at historically black colleges. Our strength as a nation must come from how we structure and afford our students quality educational opportunities. For more than 100 years, more than 105 HBCUs and universities provided access and opportunity not only to black students, but to underserved students who wanted a chance. They have stood, HBCUs have stood in the gap and served as a bridge for those students. Now, as an HBCU president, I'm often asked, are HBCUs vital? Do they continue to be relevant? And my answer is always a resounding yes. But there are some in this country, people like George Madison professor, Walter Williams and other syndicated columnists who have mistakenly represented what life at HBCUs are really like. Dr. McNeely, a colleague who's sitting behind me, said that what they've said is akin to yelling fire in a theater when there is none. That's not acceptable as legitimate free speech because of the harm that it does. What's even worse is when you have someone who's not there, who hasn't seen anything, who took what someone else said, and on secondary information yells that there is a fire. That's even worse because it perpetrates an untruth and does great harm. HBCUs didn't create the problems or challenges they face. Rather, they've stood at the forefront of the fray, ready to help find solutions. Let me tell you, I know you know the numbers. I know you know how many students we enroll. I know you know how many people we graduate. I'm not telling you everything is great. It isn't. Like our counterparts, we should be graduating more students. And if we have more resources and we can build our capacity, we will graduate more students. We want to graduate students who can critically think, who can integrate knowledge, who can speak concisely and coherently, and who can use technology. These are the students who stand in the forefront. These are the students that we're going to count on to lead us and become the next generation of leaders. For K-State and other HBCUs, we take the terror of poverty, hunger, fear, and hopelessness, and we turn it into hope. And with a little bit more money and capacity, we can do even more. That leads me to my second point. I would like to talk a little bit about how we need more graduate programs. The reauthorizing legislation proposed amendments to Section 326 that would, among other things, allow a limited number of master's degree programs to receive grants in much the same manner that the HBBI program began by admitting a small number of qualified institutions. The Senate bill would allow Coppin State University, Fayetteville State, Gramlin, West Virginia, and Kentucky State to receive grants for our eligible graduate and professional programs. I know you know this, Representative Yarman. 
The Senator made this inclusion based on his interpretation of the language. I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I want you to know that I know, and I know you know, that the language says qualified graduate programs mean graduate or professional programs that provide program of instruction in physical and natural sciences. It doesn't say terminal programs or anything else of the sort. Kentucky State University has a national reputation for our program in aquaculture. We believe that we meet every element of that program language, and we want to be included in the non-competitive language. The program appeared to the Senate and appears to K-State to meet all those qualifications. I know this committee disagrees and has taken a position that the language appears to apply to graduate and professional programs without limitation to terminal degrees. I want to ask you to reconsider that in your conference hearing. Please do so. And I want you to know that I hope the Senate will continue to keep us in that language. And I want to thank the committee, however, for committing and creating H.R. 4137 as an alternative to HBCU master's degree programs in Title IV of the Act. Kentucky State would be eligible, but that's not enough. We want to be eligible on the non-competitive side. In closing, I want to thank you for your commitment to historically black colleges and universities. By your actions every day, you tell us that you want to support the next generation of students. Our journey begins today, and I know we can count on you. My grandmother is from the country, and she told me when I stood out watching her feed the chickens and churn butter that, honey, why are you standing up there not doing anything? And I said, Grandma, nobody told me to be involved. And she said, don't ask or be told what to do. Just simply assign yourself. Thank you. HBCUs have been assigning themselves every day, and we want you to join us in that challenge. Thank you for this opportunity.